10 reasons why blacks should leave the Democratic Party. Reason number 10, choice in education. We will rescue kids from failing schools by helping their parents send them to a safe school of their choice. The proposal that I brought forth on education ends all private charter schools in this country. And tonight, tonight I say to the city of Chicago, sign a contract with the unions that does not expand charter schools in Chicago. And so the point is, if I'm president, Betsy DeVos's whole notion from charter schools to this are gone. But, but, but black and brown Democrats want choice. Do you know who doesn't? White Democrats. Poll results from Democrats for education reform. Among white Democratic voters, only 26% expressed a favorable opinion toward charters. Blacks, 58% favorable. Hispanics, 52% favorable. Again, these are among Democrats. <laughs> well, just how bad is school choice? Some charter schools have raised kids' test scores. High test scores made these charters so popular that parents line up, hoping to get their kids admitted. This line goes on and on. What's sad is that there is a line. A million kids are on waiting lists to get into charters in America. Number nine, the Democrats' refusal to even consider the privatization of Social Security, something that would disproportionately benefit blacks. Because African Americans generally have shorter life expectancies than do whites, they receive less total Social Security payments over the course of their lifetimes. Social Security also contributes to the growing wealth gap between blacks and whites. Because Social Security taxes squeeze out other forms of saving and investment, especially for low-income workers, many African Americans are unable to accumulate real wealth. And since Social Security benefits are not inheritable, that wealth inequity is compounded from generation to generation. African Americans would be among those with the most to gain from the privatization of Social Security, transforming the program into a system of individually owned, privately invested accounts." End of quote. Number eight, race-based preferences to achieve racial diversity. What this does is cause a mismatch between college and student. The student, you know, who supposedly benefited from racial preferences. This is UCLA law professor Richard Sander, who, by the way, is a Democrat. Nationally, the great bulk of uh, minority students, especially African-American students, were receiving very large preferences, typically on a scale of a couple hundred, the equivalent of a couple hundred SAT points or 10 LSAT points, 10 to 15 LSAT points. That uh, bar passing traits were generally very poor for this group. Uh, only about a third of blacks starting law school in the early 2000s were graduating and passing the bar in their first attempt. Number seven, the welfare state. LBJ's war on poverty, the intent was honorable, the effect disastrous. The illegitimacy rate among blacks was about 12%. In 1918, the illegitimacy rate among black teenagers was less than that among white teenagers. So how do you explain the increase in illegitimacy and or wedlock marriages or slovenliness in general. Well, I mean, I think any economist, economist would tell you that if you tax something, you're going to get less of it. And if you subsidize something, you're going to get more of it, whether it's wheat, cheese, or slovenly behavior. And indeed, United States, we have been subsidizing slovenly behavior. That is, we have been making the cost of illegitimacy or having kids out of wedlock relatively cheap. That is through welfare payments, through other kinds of in-kind uh, uh, payments. Number six, illegal immigration, something supported by big business for cheap labor, supported by Democrats for votes. 
George Borjas, the Harvard economist, has probably done more work on the effect of legal and illegal immigration than any other economist in the country. Because a disproportionate percentage of immigrants have few skills, it is low-skilled American workers, including many blacks and Hispanics, who have suffered most from this wage dip. The monetary loss is sizable. The typical high school dropout earns about 25K annually. According to census data, immigrants admitted in the past two decades lacking a high school diploma have increased the size of low-skilled workforce by roughly 25%. As a result, the earnings of this particularly vulnerable group drop by between $800 and $1,500 each year, end of quote. You see, Democrats realize that there are more votes in porous borders than there are in wanting to secure the borders. Because after all, they used to sound just like Donald Trump on immigration. Check out Obama, Clinton, Feinstein, and Harry Reid. Those who enter the country illegally and those who employ them disrespect the rule of law, uh, and they are showing disregard for those who are following the law. All Americans, not only in the states most heavily affected, but in every place in this country, are rightly disturbed by the large numbers of illegal aliens entering our country. The jobs they hold might otherwise be held by citizens or legal immigrants. The public service they use impose burdens on our taxpayers. I think we can enforce our borders. I think we should enforce our borders. If making it easy to be an illegal alien isn't enough, how about offering a reward for being an illegal immigrant? No, no sane country would do that, right? Number five, the Democrats' hostility towards the police. All these false accusations of institutional racism do one thing cause the cops to pull back, causing crime to go up. It's called the Ferguson effect. Well, the Ferguson effect is the twin phenomenon of officers backing off of proactive policing and the resulting increase in crime. Last year, we had the largest one-year increase in homicide in nearly a half century. The vast majority of the victims of that homicide increase have been black. The reason for this crime increase, I believe, is that officers are living today under a false and dangerous narrative that says that they are shot through with systemic racism, that we're living through an epidemic of racially biased police shootings, and that the type of proactive policing that I think is responsible for a 20-year crime decline that this nation has enjoyed uh, is under attack as racially oppressive. Number four, Democrats' job-killing policies. As my dad used to always say, I never got a job from a poor person. Let's just take one example, the ever-increasing minimum wage. Thus, the consequences of minimum wage rates have been almost wholly bad to increase unemployment and to increase poverty. Moreover, the effects have been concentrated on the groups that the do-gooders would most like to help. The people who have been hurt most by minimum wage laws are the blacks. I have often said that the most anti-Negro law on the books of this land is the minimum wage rate. If minimum wages can make people richer... The unions are talking about Well, now. if unions can make people yeah. richer, well, all you have to do is tell people in Bangladesh, why don't you unionize and demand a higher wage? You can be rich like the United States. Number three, the Great Recession. The Great Recession was really an affirmative action recession. How so? Because of pressure put on banks, literally a gun to their head, they lowered lending standards to the point where virtually anybody who could fog up a mirror was able to buy a house. A disproportionately large number of people who never should have bought homes bought them, and when the inevitable recession came, they lost everything, including the money they put into their homes. Peter Wollaston is a Republican member of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission set up by Congress to look into the origins of the Great Recession. Here is what he said. Without the government's housing policy, there would never have been a financial crisis. That's not exactly the same thing as saying that government housing policy caused the financial crisis. It's stating it another way, and that is, if we hadn't had the government's housing policy, that is, or but for the government's housing policy, there wouldn't have been a financial crisis. The subprime mortgage was essentially invented 
after the 1995 amendments to the Community Reinvestment Act, which put a gun to the head right. of all lenders, banks and non-banks, it said you must, you must make subprime loans, below prime loans at favorable interest terms to low income people, to downright poor people, to Im immigrants, Can to I Latinos, etc. No, I want to finish this point. Sorry. I want to get this out on the table. It's been bugging me for a long time. Jerry Boy is the only one that got this story right. This meant that, in fact, if these lenders did not make these subprime loans, their business plans would be disrupted. They couldn't acquire. Right. They couldn't merge. They couldn't go into new markets. And it gave inordinate power to local community groups like the Acorn Group to essentially rat out the lender and tell the Fed and the control of the currency that you guys, they're not doing what you want them to do. So guess what? With the era of easy money, that was like pouring gasoline and lighting a match to the Community Reinvestment Act, which set the stage for these unbelievably yeah. Can stupid I uh, subprime mortgages. Number two, the constant, incessant playing of the race card for votes. Let us say with one voice, the words of James Cleveland's great freedom hymn, I don't feel no ways tired. I come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that the road would be easy. I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. Look at what they value and look at their budget and what they're proposing. Romney wants to let the, he said in the first hundred days, he's going to let the big banks once again write their own rules. Unchain Wall Street. They're going to put you all back in chains. This country, though we may not be in El Paso, Texas, is still racist at its foundation, at its core, and throughout this system. <laughs> Are they in some sort of time warp? Did they sleep through the fact that a black man got elected and re-elected president of the United States of America? And the fact that there were 700 counties who voted for Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012, 200 of them switched to Trump in 2016. When were they bitten by the racist radioactive spider? And guess what? The town that most voted for Donald Trump was Abilene, Texas, 80%. According to the 2010 census, it's 75% white. Guess which town just voted for their first black mayor? Abilene, Texas. Orlando Patterson is a Harvard sociologist and a Democrat. Here's what he said almost 30 years ago. America is now the least racist white majority society in the world. Has a better record of legal protection of minorities than any other society, white or black, and offers more opportunities to a greater number of black persons than any other society, including all of Africa." End of quote. And number one, Democrats are the pro-abortion party. Nationally, black women terminate pregnancies at far higher rates than other women as well. In 2014, 36% of all abortions were performed on black women, who were just 13% of the female population, end of quote. Do you know who else agrees that the Democratic Party made a mistake in becoming the pro-abortion party? Former Democratic President Jimmy Carter. I've signed a public letter calling for the Democratic Party at the next convention to espouse my position on abortion, which is to minimize the need, requirement for abortion, and limit it only to women whose life are in danger or who are pregnant as a result of rape or incest. I think if the Democratic Party would adopt that policy, that would be acceptable to a lot of people who are now estranged from our party because of the abortion issue, end of quote. Jimmy Carter said this. I have had a problem with abortion, you know, and this has been a long time problem of mine. I, I, I have a hard time believing that, that, that Jesus, for instance, yeah. would approve abortions. Those are 10 reasons I can think of why blacks ought to rethink their allegiance to the Democratic Party. I have more reasons, but we don't have any more time. I'm Larry Elder, and this has been The Larry Elder Show for Epic Times. I'll see you next time.